how could Catholics and Protestants be so far apart on the subject of saints? And what happened? I'm sorry. I read this book. This is the book, this Bible. I don't care what version you're reading for the sake of my comment. This is what is contained in here, the contents of this book, that should determine your thoughts, your ideas. When, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to call yourself even a Jew, they read the first half of this, the Old Testament, should be the catalyst. It should be your GPS. It should be the all-in-all -all guide to navigate your faith. As you know, last week we started into the book of Colossians. Last week I gave a brief introduction. I touched on very general information. I'm going to add to that information and try to touch on some other areas of history that maybe are not really relevant at first blush, but actually they become quite relevant if we're trying to determine and ascertain what exactly happened to these churches, and specifically the churches of Asia Minor that Paul was writing to. Now we have a good timeline historically. Between 25 BC and 235 AD, we have Roman control of the territory. I'm, being, I'm referring to as Asia Minor, but was called Anatolia. Um, also, there are names that we derive from other languages. For example, Asia Minor is from the Greek, Mikra, Asia, and we actually can trace back the origins of when it got coined that to somewhere in the mid 300s from a Christian scholar who coined the term. But what's important, um, I could talk to you about a lot of different things, but what began my fascination here was knowing how um, Jews in Asia Minor came to be there and knowing how, you know, there's this, this really cool term that's used as a blanket in the Bible or when we talk about those who are of the faith and those who are not, pagans. But that really does do an injustice to history. Um, the history and the people known in a diversity of ways, but specifically known as the Celts or the Keltoi, the Celtic people. Um, there's an incredible study that I started probably, I'm going to say, four or five years ago that I actually went back to and I said, okay, I won't touch it now because it's complex and it deals with several other um, things. It's opening up a can of worms. But I want you to think about these people who no one can really pinpoint, none of the secular, a few uh, historical chroniclers have, have made bridge the gap between who these people are. But imagine the land before it has any established church, because the church is by the church age after Christ. Imagine what that land would have been like having had the myriad number of settlers come and go and all in, in war over territory. And we're not just talking about the Celts or the Keltoi, we're talking about people like the Hittites. And there's, I mean, there's a whole pattern of people that will come into that land, that will settle it, and then wars take place, and one group is ousted, or then migrates, or is completely wiped out. So this, in, in this brain right here, this is the stuff that brings in a lot of questions. For example, if we're talking about when at the time after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, at the time of the Apostle Paul planting and founding churches there in Asia Minor, we have descendants of an incredible rainbow of people. We can't just settle on the word pagan. It does great disservice, but it helps us to understand something else. A lot of the worship in that general area is, and it cannot be again just put out as simply pagan with one word that's supposed to be a blanket for everything. And in fact, if we start to dig, which I'm not going to do today, but maybe we'll come back and revisit this. When you start to dig, you find some incredible, they're either coincidences, which I don't believe they are, or you find some incredible foundation that's even more faith fortifying to understand how on earth 
did this early faith actually take root in a place where if you think about, we, we talk about America as the melting pot, but think of Asia Minor as layers and layers and layers of people coming and going. So there's this fascination, which is a completely different study that will, if we would look at those people, give us great clarity into some other matters regarding the Colossian problem. For example, in one place it is said uh, in Colossians that these people, Paul is correcting, but he's talking about the fact that these people are worshiping angels. And what's interesting, as I told you, there was um, an excavation that just briefly, not even a deep dig, it was really only a surface of the area we know as Colossae, but in the neighboring town, uh, Hierapolis, Hierapolis and Laodicea that became actually important hubs for that time, we have uh, a dig that happened that was done in 1960, between 61 and 63, 1961, this uh, current age, uh, by the Laval University from Quebec that they were digging at Hierapolis. And what they discovered there is kind of fascinating. They discovered a tomb um, of, these would have been people that came from Palestine. The tomb is of Philip and purportedly some portion of his daughters that prophesied. Does that sound remotely familiar to you? Because those are people from the Bible. This was found there at that point, including in the fifth century, we know there was also something uh, erected there called the Martyrion of Philip. Now, why is that important? It's a fifth century find, we know that, but why is it important? Martyrion, like the Greek word, anything that usually ends in ion, talks about the place of, and we know that the word, we get our word for martyr from that Greek word. So it's either the witness of Philip or the martyr's death of Philip, something that was erected to him in Hierapolis. And I find a lot of these things are fascinating because if we consider a lot of the history, and when I say history, it's hard history from secular sources, not the Bible. And we've got ample information to give us clues as to the community. As I said, there was a great flux of Palestinian settlers at Colossae. And a lot of this, well, you'd say, of course, it's part of, it's alongside of a major trade route and, of course, going east and west, and you've got some major cities. Um, but from a historical and ecclesiastical point of view, we've got some good information here. Uh, for example, in the first half of the second century, a bishop of Hierapolis was named Papias. Papias purportedly was an eyewitness to the Apostle John, the disciple of Christ, the one that was exiled on Patmos that actually made his home or his hub at a later time, Ephesus. So Papias' interpretation of the Gospels becomes uh, highly used by Eastern and Western churches. The other thing that is an important thing if you're into church history that comes out of this area is a man named Montanus. Um, he arrives in that general area about in the 150s AD and he begins to, he goes into a trance and he begins to prophesy. He and the people with him, prophets and prophetesses, begin to prophesy. And all this would have been great because he was saying that he was prophesying by the power of the Holy Spirit except that this, this interesting phenomena actually becomes part of a very deep uh, line of heretical doctrines that begin to creep into the church. See, Montanus and his followers that are called, well, they're called Montanus, he's Montanus, um, they believe that the gift is only given to them, the gift of the Holy Spirit is only given to them, it's a contradiction of the Bible, that prophecy and pr the prophetic element was only given to them and essentially by virtue of what was preached that essentially Christ's finished work was not enough, there's something more. So as we know, that is not gonna fly. I've said to you 
a bazillion times, great exaggeration. There is no new revelation. Anyone who comes and says they have a new revelation, revelation something to add on, well, you can know that that's not possible. The Bible tells us there will be no other revelation or if you want to call a revealed sign or word except Jesus Christ. That's the last sign and revelation from God the Father to us here. And when he comes back again, that will be a sign to everybody else who didn't hear or read when they had the time to. But what's interesting about this is it becomes such a deep issue that if you read church history, you will find these people make great controversy. There are several church councils that are held, but the one in particular is to basically get rid of these people. They, were, they preached legalism and this type of moral rigidness. Uh, for example, if people fasted, they would implement, well, you've got to fast twice or three times as long for it to be counted as a fast. Uh, or, for example, they were not allowed, if you followed Montanus and his teaching, you were not allowed to flee um, from martyrdom. That became not a choice. And last but not least, and you have to kind of hear what I'm going to say, because this is part of the Montanus problem, but it becomes a lot of other heretical issues that will all come together in this same mindset to pervert the gospel, but to pervert other things pertaining to believers. The Montanists preached that marriage was greatly discouraged, that it would be better for people to stay celibate and alone. Now, this was never a doctrine of Christ. If that was, then you would not have seen Christ going in to heal Peter's mother-in-law laying sick with a fever. There are, there's a lot of um, current modern-day contradictions that are... Mm. They're called doctrine and dogma by certain factions of folks who call themselves Christians, but they are not in the Bible, and they have no place within Christianity. Um, and I'm going to be I'm going to be talking about heretical stuff today. This is what you have to do sometimes to make a point. Um, let me just finish the, the the brief history here that I have because my tendency is to go away and. Has anybody ever asked the question? Some of you may know the answer, and that's okay, but have you ever asked the question? If this was such a deep hub of Christendom, of churches planted, basically the seedbed for the gospel going out and growth and everything else, and we're looking at what is now in approximation modern-day Turkey, what happened to Christianity? And so, like I said, I won't do it today, but if you follow the history, by the time you get to 1922-23 in the Treaty of Lausanne, you have an interesting exchange that happens. The people who had settled, that were Christians who had perhaps settled in Turkey, and the folks who were of Greek background or Greek origin that became Muslims that settled on the other side, so kind of a swap of people they were allowed to swap under that agreement under religious basis. So if you were a Christian, you went to Greece. That means if you were in that land of Turkey and a Christian, you went to Greece, even if you were Turkish of descent. And if you were a Greek person who was a Muslim, under that exchange, you went to the Muslim land and they just did it on a basis of religion, not of anything else. So by virtue of that, what is there today is a scant and very faint trace of Christianity, almost completely eradicated. And that should kind of, that's kind of mind-boggling if you think about it, that we're some, say, 2,000 years removed, and look what's happened in 2,000 years. That's why I said history is incredibly important. Um, some of the most notable names that come out of that area, people that you would most certainly know, uh, if you study history, Pythagoras is one of them. Um, there's, all, in fact, there's a lot of famous people, Herodotus, the father of history. And then there's a man who hails from Cilicia, from a place called 
tarsus, which is well within the boundaries of the area I'm talking about. And his name is Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. So this is a very important region. Um, equally, it's an important region because the Book of Acts says that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, again, well within that geographical territory. So we can't just pass by this and say, oh, okay, Colossae, okay, now we're gone, because there's so much information there. Even if you don't like history, I would strongly recommend just, even if it's a brief one, okay, simple and brief, to understand the successive waves of people and the battles that were fought to give you a good indicator of not only how impossible, if you think about it, that Christianity actually survived outside of that territory, but it did, but equally how on earth did the remnants, which we still have bits and pieces of, how did they survive seeing that there were so many successive invasions and wars and new inhabitants and so forth. So you get the idea. And that's what is fascinating to me. There isn't a, a set answer, uh, but it is, to me, it is extremely fascinating. Now that brings us to the actual letter itself. And um, time to open up our Bibles. We'll go to the book of Colossians. And um, we started last week with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So I'm going to stop right there because the recipients, we last week looked at the sender, and the sender we know and the author is Paul. Uh, why I said to you why Timothy is mentioned there could be any number of things, but Timothy was well known to be Paul's work companion, his fellow laborer, uh, and well known amongst these people. So we have the sender and the recipients. So the recipients, and I basically, I'm titling this message um, just like this. Um, we have here saints, uh, faithful, and brethren. These are the recipients in Christ. Now, um, kind of interesting. There's no mention of the church. It is implied, but if we're, if we're not sure, and we know this is to a church, but if we're not sure, there is word, by the way, where it says that this letter should be circulated and read to the other churches. So we know for a fact um, we're dealing with a church, the Greek word ecclesia, which I said does not appear, but we shouldn't read too much into that. Why? because you have the openings of other letters, such as Romans, Philippians, and Ephesians that give, give the same type of salutation. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't make an issue of that. But what I am going to make an issue of today might surprise you. No, nah, maybe not. All right. I want to talk about the saints first. Let's talk about those, those saints. All right. So to better understand uh, this word saints, which is describing a, a description of sorts of the people who are receiving this letter, I travel back a little bit into the Old Testament to better understand the nature of this word to make a hard point about something which some of my listeners will not like, but oh well, c'est la vie. So here we go. Um, first and foremost, in the Old Testament, we're not looking at the Greek word hagios. We're looking at the Hebrew word. Uh, I'll do phonetic here. And kadosh, kadosh, kadesh, kadosh, depending on the vowels underneath. And if we start in Genesis, there are very few concepts or words. There will be, I should say, that start that again. There are concepts that, that point to something holy, but the word itself is not there. It's when you get into Exodus, and the point I'm going to make, kind of stay with me here. When you get into Exodus, the first example of the word holy is in Exodus 3, 5, where 
Moses is approaching the burning bush, the tree that was on fire, that was not consumed. And the voice, which is the voice of God, says, Moses, take off your shoes. The ground on which you're standing is holy. Now, I ask you a question. Does that mean that the ground did some good act benevolently? <laughs> did it perform a miracle? OK, I didn't think so, because it's just the ground, right? But if you keep going you, and you go through um, Exodus, I believe, and don't quote me on this, but the number of uses in Exodus of the word holy is very high. And I'm going to put it at somewhere around, and this is a guesstimate because I don't have my paper in front of me, a guesstimate of approximately 70 times. Of those 70 times, it could be 50. I'll have to correct myself next week when I see you again. But in any event, that word is only used of human beings. If it's 50 or 70 times, it's only used of human beings in Exodus, possibly at the most three, but no more than five times. Most of it is having to do with the holy place, the mountain, the holy place where God's presence was. Most of, most of it has to do with the holy garments, for example, that they were instructed to make, or the holy anointing oil, or the holy utensils, or all the construction for the tabernacle. All of this labeled holy, but only somewhere between three and five of those 50 to 70 references pertain to humans, foremost to the priesthood. So I ask you, and let's just take my lower number for a minute and just say it occurs 50 times, and maybe only less than five of those 50 times are used of humans, and the rest of it is of inanimate objects. Can we say of those inanimate objects that they performed miracles, that they were virtuous and distinct because of some type of inanimate performance that they did? That's rhetoric. That's stupidity. So the reason why I'm saying this is, and I'm going to make my point, and then I'm going to, we're going to kill it, OK? I started reading this, and I thought, wow, this is my opportunity. So I look at everything as an opportunity. This is my opportunity to make clear something that's bugged me for a long time. You know, can you imagine growing up and you're told your patron saint is, and that's the name of your patron saint, because of the day you were born, because of the church you're affiliated with, and then you find out that your patron saint has special powers to do special things. They're like uh, little ninjas that you can set up on your night table, and they can defend you or do whatever for you, right? Sounds good. Sounds like a cool thing you know, in the mind of a child, perhaps. But here's the thing. It, it really bugged me. Remember I told you, no one can ask more questions than me. It really bugged me. Why, how could Catholics and Protestants be so far apart on the subject of saints? And what happened? I'm sorry. I read this book. This is the book, this Bible. I don't care what version you're reading, for the sake of my comment. This is what is contained in here, the contents of this book, that should determine your thoughts, your ideas. When, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to call yourself even a Jew, they read the first half of this, the Old Testament, should be the catalyst. It should be your GPS. It should be the all-in-all -all guide to navigate your faith. So my question is, how is it possible that two entities that essentially started off as one that have bifurcated and now perhaps more than bifurcated into uh, umpteen different fragments, how could we be reading the same verse of scripture and one group of people says, well, this is to dead people, to the saints. The saints means dead people who are already dead versus we who are reading this book, who can clearly see to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. That would be in present times, at the present when Paul was writing, which means not dead people, right? And if you go through the whole book, the whole New Testament, there are salutations to the saints at, to the saints at this church, to the saints that are here. And these are people who are, at least in the day of this writing, were alive. So what happened? Where did we go wrong? And that, that's what's living in this brain. It's kind of frightening. <laughs> so 
I started on this thinking, I'm going to set this once and for all in place. If people want to get mad, they can do it. And if they like what they're hearing, they can go check out more and uh, figure out that at some point, we have to say if we're Christians, we're, we're standing on this, not on another human being's ideas of what we should believe. And there, there enters in this great uh, problem. So, okay, Paul uses this word. Let me write it out in the Greek for you. This Greek word for saints, I'll write it, we'll write it in English better so you can pronounce it. Hagios or some, sometimes hagioi, depending on what we're reading. And we know that this word grouping comes from a whole grouping of words in the Greek that would be ag, ag-centered, both the two, um, this is made by ha, hagios. Uh, so these are the two letters. This grouping of words actually uh, is from an Indo-Germanic root, the old Indian, I know that sounds weird, old Indian, yaj, which is to sacrifice, or yaj ya, which is worthy of reverence. So we, we have a kind of a derivative of that word. But if you go to any theological dictionary, and the theological dictionary is not Catholic or Protestant, it's just a dictionary, okay? So you can, wh whatever your faith walk is, you can approach the dictionary with confidence. It has no bias. It's just words from Greek words from the New Testament. And in there, you can find for yourself, if you're interested in looking, information that clearly says that this word was never intended, neither was it intended in its Hebraic use, to connote anything about significant about the person's virtue or their good deeds. It had not a thing to do with that. And the word itself, both from the Hebrew, and let me go back for a second and talk about this from the Hebrew, and you'll see the meaning does not change that much. From the Hebrew, we have this word grouping. It's kind of interesting. Kadosh is, is the group uh, that we're looking at, and depending on if you make it into a noun by adding the vav, or, but regardless, in this word grouping, Etymologically, if you were just to chop off and take these two, kof and dalid, from the Hebrew, that brings you to a word to mean to, to divide or to separate. So we know this word is simply saying something that has been divided or separated out from the ordinary for use to the deity or of the deity. But this is important. It cannot become strictly a Jewish or Christian word, because in Greek culture, they use this to talk about the, the cultic temple prostitutes who were considered hagios or hagioi. So it's not, it, it, you've got to follow the development of the word. And clearly there, even the Greeks understood, if you're going to make a temple prostitute hagioi, uh, need I finish the statement about good and virtuous? Never mind. So. Uh, yeah, that's another part of the equation here. So, when you go back and look at uh, the Hebrew first, Kadosh, you see how the intended uses. When God spoke to Moses and he said, for example, the Sabbath, the Sabbath day is holy. It's a day that's set apart. It's, it's in the calendar in the days of the week with all the other days, but it's supposed to be set out and set apart. So although it still belongs within the entity of, or the genre in which it belongs, God said, this day is separate, and therefore this day is called holy. It can't be understood as you doing beneficent, good, godly things. It can only be understood as God's choosing of something. And if if I'm understanding this aright, which I am understanding this aright, it was never based on the performance of the person. So let's talk about those priests when they were called holy and they were to make holy garments and be anointed with holy oil. 
but they were holy in that instant for performing these particular duties. And then think about this. They were still humans. They still went home, wait for it, to their wives and still made children and still had norm normalcy in their life. So it wasn't as though these people somehow become the, the uh, sour-faced, emaciated, uh, like you just bit into a lemon and that somehow is holy. You're a holy person if you look like that because <laughs> it means you have not had a moment of happiness in your life, therefore holy, no. So although I have seen some people that look like that, my point is it is interesting to peel apart this concept that so easily has morphed into, you know, think about it, the largest held, uh, I, I still believe the numbers are still true. I haven't looked at recent numbers, but as recently as I think five years ago, the Catholic Church still has impressive numbers of people who adhere to its teachings. My question isn't, I'm not against Catholics or Protestants or Anglicans, but what I am against is don't call yourself something in name and not look in this book and understand that it is a blatant contradiction to the Word of God and don't put a halo around it because a man declared that this is part of the church. No. Only one man declared this is part of the church and that one man's voice emanates from the Holy Spirit that has inspired the writers to write these 66 canonized books. So when somebody says to me, well, what about the saints? Well, let's talk about the saints. Indulge me for a minute because I probably won't ever do this again. But if we can understand the history and development of within the Catholic Church of sainthood, and saints, you begin to peel back some heavy-duty layers of misinformation. If you go to about the 10th century, in the Catholic historical, their own advent ledgers, all right? 10th century brings about a man who, uh, his name is Ulrich, and kind of heralds from the, the place that will give prominence to Martin Luther at a much later time. But this was a man who was a bishop and performed his duties. And there was nothing really, I guess, highly different from him and a thousand other bishops. But at some point, the pope of his era, after he died, was petitioned by the people to make this man a saint. That's kind of the origins of that. And that began a process from the 10th century forward of basically putting people in a special category. But the teachings of the Catholic Church began to deviate grossly from this book in that everywhere I read in this book, a saint is simply a person who has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. A saint is a person who is still a sinner. Sorry to tell you that, being saved by grace, not by works, but by grace. You're working it out. You're imperfect, serving the perfect one, okay? There isn't any great deeds of benevolence or great good virtuous. You know, some people may be considered better than others, but God sees it all the same. I'll repeat the scripture that is the banner for this church. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. Doesn't say some, it says all, and fallen short of the glory of God, okay? So... What we have in the development of this subject, if you trace enough of this back, you will find the bulk of it, of what I'm talking about regarding saints and sainthood, isn't in this book. It was never in this book. The design of that word was never intended to address dead people. And then here's my question to you, because this, this is where the rubber meets the road. By about 1230, 1240 A.D., um, there's enough pressure because everybody wants to become a saint that the Pope says, enough. I am the only one that can make this decision and declare someone a saint. The rest of you peons be silent, all right? That's kind of the, what happened. There's a history according to the Scots, okay? Uh, but this, this gets really interesting because, remember, don't get mad at me, okay? Remember how 
Catholic doctrine says the Pope is the vicar of Christ and he's infallible. Well, ask me the question or ask yourselves the question. And the question is not, do you feel lucky? But ask yourself the question, if, if what they declare is true and the Pope is infallible, which means everything that he says is right and he does never, ever, ever make a mistake, correct? That's what it means, infallible. How did they get it so wrong in the case of Joan of Arc? for example. So she is excommunicated and burned. We want to make sure that we really got rid of you. So we're going to excom excommunicate you, and then we're going to burn you at the stake. And then in 1909, she is brought up for beatification, which is the first process to sainthood. And in 1920 or 30, she becomes canonized as a saint of the church. So let me get this straight. A pope back there said, heretic burn her, get her out of the church. That's infallible. How do you reverse that? <laughs> Does anybody ask these questions? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm saying, really, listen, we, every dimension of our faith has elements that you've got to look a little closer. But the reason why I bring this up, and it's very frustrating because I've tried to have conversations with people and ask, how could a dead person that you don't know, that you've never met, who has no power, there's only one person that has power, and that's Jesus Christ. How could a dead person, why, first of all, why are you praying to a dead person? Why are you lighting a candle for a dead saint? Now, I'm, 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 listen, I know that these are customs, but I wrote down something somewhere that just struck me. It's, it's a quote from an article. And in the article, which is a Catholic article, they clearly use the word tradition. It is our tradition. Well, doesn't the Bible say you've made void the word of God by your tradition. tradition? There you go. So I have a conflict here, and I have a duty. I don't do this to poke fun and to abase people. I have a duty to teach proper information on Christian doctrine. I'm tired of people who have not spent one hour in Christian studies. They may sit in a pew in a church, for their whole life, but they've not spent an hour to ask the questions that tell me they're genuinely concerned about really understanding the things of God and not about the doctrines and the machinations of human people who decided, well, this will help you. Do you want to know fundamentally why the Catholic Church keeps promoting? Uh, I found an excellent article that explained it for me, that why they keep promoting this. I'll just give you the, the, the quick version of it is if we can remember the life of someone, especially that of a person who was martyred for their faith, then we can go back and we can look at their commitment to Christ and we can possibly, wait for it, imitate it. Now, listen to me. If you're wanting, if you're wanting to be the cheap cologne knockoff, knock yourself out but I'm one, the authentic thing. And the authentic, it's either the authentic thing or nothing for me. Or I could choose to be anything else if I can't find what is authentic Christianity. And authentic Christianity comes to me by way, first and foremost, of Jesus Christ, secondly, through his spirit, by the Father. And ultimately, I'm reading my Bible and I'm looking at what is the only roadmap that has been left me, not the interpretation that's been heavily rested to appease the mass multitudes. And that's exactly what this doctrine of sainthood and calling people, dead people, saints. So let me say it this way. If we follow this whole word from cover to cover, we encounter some very basic and very simple thoughts. That's why I go back to Exodus 3, 5, when God says, the ground you're standing on is hallowed. Take off your shoes. It's holy. And I asked you the question, why? Because here, here are the, the, the doctrines or the criteria according to the Catholic Church that must be met for something, but specifically here, someone to become a saint. The person must show Christian virtues, whatever that means. Whatever that means. They must have a reputation for holiness. I do. 
I had a moth in my closet, made some holes in my coat. I have a reputation for holiness. They must have performed a miracle. That one I'm just going to take the fifth on. The individual must freely and voluntarily offer their life in the face of, of certain and soon death. And there must be a close relationship between the offering of one's life and the premature death of the one who offers it. Huh? All right, anyway, so if those are the criteria for sainting things, I'm going to ask it again. Because out of the same language that saints dead people, we have Holy Communion and words like the Holy Bible. Well, yes, it's, it's a book that is set apart, I guess, from other books, or Communion, which is set apart from other types of Communion. But in the big picture, some act that has been separated out from the ordinary to be performed either in memory of or in the presence of or by the faith of our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And when I go back and I read Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, in Christ which are at Colossae, or if I go to Philippians and I can read you the same thing here where it says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. In other words, if you go through the books, you find out that all the salutations pretty much contain or refer to the saints who are at this place in this current day alive. Wow. So that was a big, long haul for just to make a point. But my point is it's important for us to understand something. And I don't do what I do to abase or to, to shame. My question is always, where is that in the Bible? Where, when somebody says, well, that's doctrine. Where? Because I'm going to say this again. This book gives me the roadmap. It also tells me we're not to add or take away. So why would somebody come up with the idea that, well, you know, this is a good thing. We'll just we'll turn it into this, and this is how things start. It's always with a good intention, perhaps. But then people get attached to this concept, and it becomes doctrine of the church, and it becomes dogma of the church. And I have issues with that because if Paul was combating, we'll, we'll, we'll read all about the things that he's combating in this church, but I use the, the angel worship as a beginning to say, you see how easy it is. And I'm really wanting this to hit home to un for you to understand the spirit of why I do what I do. How easy it is to, let's just assume that all of this um, entrenchment of heretical teaching happened within probably no more than five, 10 years, maybe at best 20 years, but no more than that where people were saying, well, you have to do this, and you must be doing that, and we're going to encounter what some of these are, and just look at our history. And this happened in, we'll say, in the brief span of no more than 30 or 40 years at best from the writing of this letter, and it was already going on before because the problems are being addressed, versus 2,000 years almost of the same type of morphing taking things out of context and making it whole cloth doctrine and selling it to the multitudes as if they can put their faith in this and they can put their trust in this because their soul will be safe praying to dead people. This is, now this is me speaking, not Pastor Scott. This is Melissa Scott, a Christian woman, more importantly, someone who loves this word and even the people who I find quite unpleasant at times, I still pray for them. I pray for them to come and see the light and know what the light is from this book. But how can you get people to see the light when they're convinced that their doctrine, which does not come from this book, is light and everything else is wrong and everyone else is not a true believer of the faith? So when I do these types of things, it's, it's for one reason and one reason alone, to prove the point that it can happen in any age. Look, I, I remember doing this with the word Trinity, but I'll use a better one. I started this service by speaking or referencing about the term 
of them being called Christians. Do you realize the word Christian only occurs twice in the New Testament, just twice? That's not a lot considering that that is our faith. One time it's Paul before Agrippa trying to convince him. He says, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. And the other time is coming out of Peter's mouth when he's referencing something and he's saying for suffering uh, for the Christian. Now, just because the word is not on every single line doesn't take away the doctrine or the understanding. But reverse that idea and be sure that anything that we want to classify as doctrine must come out of this book. There can't be this, well, yeah, but then this is what people do, the same thing that people do. I've touched on this many times. The same people will do this with giving. Do you realize that God said the tithe was holy? And he said it was holy unto the Lord. That means it was his. And you'll still have people to this day, well, I'm not going to tithe, this my money. Complete lack of understanding of when it was implemented, what it meant in this book. And these are the things that I want us to be really cognizant of. You know, if I were going to, I made a title for this, but if I were going to tell you there are several things in this book that I'm now seeing as almost quite foundational to understand Paul's writing about Christ his preeminence, that he must be all in all, and this is peppered throughout the whole letter. I'd also say the second part to this would be on a treatise on being a Christian. And Gene Scott was right, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a Christian, be one. Don't, don't play around with these you know, uh, terms and you either are or you're not. You are either trying to follow this book and understand what the revelation is from this book, or you're not. There's nothing in between. Don't talk to me about going to church and listening to a 20-minute homily about social justice issues when the responsibility of the pastor, the minister, the priest is to teach the Word of God, proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and yes, are there still things going on in the world? Yes, you, you teach people from this book that there are certain things as Christians we can do to combat, but we are not to be conformed to the world. We are to be transformed into the image and likeness of Christ, which I'm, you know, if you're not teaching people those concepts, how can they even know that that's what the church is for, let alone that we're not praying to dead people? So, uh, yeah. I think I've, I've said enough uh, on this subject. So, saints and faithful brethren. Hagios kai pistois adelphois in Christo. That's enough. In Christo. This is. Uh, would be translated either holy or saints, and we're using the word saints, and kai and pistos, faithful believers, those of the faith, brothers in Christ. Kind of interesting, you could read by this and not see it, but as we have Paul describing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, the saints, faithful, saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. And I thought this was interesting that this type of greeting, saints and faithful brethren, three ways to talk about people instead of using the word church, ecclesia, outcalled ones, or instead of using the Greek word exalexito, chosen out from among those who weren't, here we have these three words which pretty much sum up those which have been called by God, God called you out from among people he did not call. Those who are in the faith and of the faith, but in this case, brothers in Christ, and brothers. We have three terms here. Now let me ask you a question. If, if saint, sainthood, the saints, has nothing to do with good behavior, or it has nothing to do inherently with 
with anything that I might do, but has everything to do with what God does when he called and chose. It means each and every person in the sound of my voice is a saint. To the person who is just coming out of a drug stupor right now at 12.15 on Sunday morning, listening to me, you're a saint. To the person who's been walking with the Lord for 60 years and it's just part of their life, they're a saint. To the man whose wife just served him with divorce papers, you're a saint. I don't know about her, but you are. <laughs> All right. So what I'm trying to say is how we got into this perversion of the word versus a description of believers. Something about us, all of us, no matter how good or how bad, how old or how young, which is you're a saint. In fact, these three words nicely balance in his opening greeting to the people at this church. Nicely balance uh, a good way of describing the people of the church in Paul's day, but it should also describe the people of the church in this day. Now, just think of that when you... The greeting is to these people at Colossae. The greeting is also to you. Saints, faithful ones, those who are trusting in Christ, brothers in Christ. Do you think that that sounds anything like the church today? Doesn't, does it? Why do you think? Don't answer, because it's too long. Well, I'll be sounding, I'll be sounding like grumpy people who woke up too early, right? But. It doesn't sound like the church today because, again, look at how we have boogered the meaning of saints to begin with. Then there's the word faithful. You know, some people think that that word in the setting of this has to do with something other than fidelity to Christ. It doesn't mean perfection. It means fidelity. It means I trust him in all matters in my life when, when things are good and when things are not so good. Faithful brothers in Christ, faithful to show up, faithful to study, faithful to pray for the rest of the body, faithful to pray for your enemies, faithful to remember that God chose you. And yes, he did choose you amongst people he did not choose. That's just exactly the doctrine of the Bible. And then the last word that I've circled here, Adelphois, brothers. And that will be the last thing I talk about in my message. I'm going to close out my message on this. The definition is not sanguinal except sanguinal through the blood of Christ. The definition of brotherhood is not, I cover your back. I can get your back, but I'm not covering up your back. The definition of brotherhood is being able to be a brother or a sister in the Lord. I have found in this day and age, there are very few people who even understand what that means. Most of the people that I've met outside of this church, their idea of brethren in Christ or the family of God are, again, morphed, rested scriptures, but not actually what is. And I can tell you this, if the church were to gravitate back to the essential meanings of just these three words, Saints, faithful, and let's, let's use the, the, the clause, brothers in Christ. We'd start changing the church back to the original intent of its founder, Jesus Christ. Do you realize if we started looking at ourselves as truly chosen out from among people who weren't chosen, and we, it, that, come, that rolls off the lips, but do you believe it in your heart? Which shouldn't give rise to some elitist group, well, I was called and you weren't, but rather... You look upon the whole world, and instead of looking down, you look eye to eye, and you may see a brother or a sister who may not be a brother or sister in Christ yet. But you look for those things, and the Lord leads, and I've told you, you know, we, we are a walking opportunity of faith every single day because we will meet people who might have a um, less than stellar definition of what a saint is. Or we may meet people who might not understand what a brother in Christ is. Brother in Christ, I can say this to you, the foremost, it, it is exactly what Colossians is talking about, that in everything, Christ might have preeminence, that he's the focal, most important part, the integrity 
of the believer is the focus of Christ. That's it. Not my perfection because I don't have any. Not my excellency because I don't have any. Not my good deeds because no one cares about that. And it's certainly not going to get me. And I'm, I'm not saying don't do good. I'm saying don't do good and think that that's analogous to or tautologous to you're going to be saved because you do good things. Even heathen people do good things. So all I'm saying to you today is for those saints, faithful, and brethren in Christ or cistern in Christ, uh, it's good for us sometimes to stop and take a little bit of inventory, both of the things we've come to know and accept and the things that maybe we haven't put our feelers out to really wrap our mind around. I'm going to tell you something. This will happen for at least one of you. And this is not some prophetic utterance. This is just reality. It will happen for at least one of you in the near future to have a conversation with one of your friends over this meaning of saint if you already haven't had it. And the fantastic thing is you don't have to convince anybody of you being right. All you've got to do is point them to history to their own history books, to their own annals that describe in detail and give this clarification and juxtapose it with the words in this Bible that say, you know, let's go back into the Old Testament for a minute. That whore that they sought to take refuge with, Rahab. And this is not a joke. In the modern world today, people say, a woman like that could never be considered a saint. But she makes the cut for me, and many individuals like her, men or women, in this book, for their acts of courage in the face of potential danger. I understand the idea of honoring a martyr, but more importantly, her faith, not the actions, her faith translated into, if, if, this, if these are the instructions of God, as wacky as they seem, I'm going to hang that cord out my window and trust that God's word will be true and that me and my family will be spared. And that's exactly what happened. If I, if I were to put a word on top of that woman, it would be saint. But guess what? There are choices that we make each and every day that may not be as dramatic as Rahab, but they are in the same vein whether to trust Christ or to lean on the arm of the flesh. Now, there, there shouldn't be any special medal or special recognition because today you decided to trust Christ, because today you decided that you need God. But there should be something in your heart that says, thank God that God led me and opened up my eyes to understand I'm called and I'm chosen, and therefore I am a saint, as bad or as good. I'm a saint, praise God, I'm a saint. Hopefully, there'll be people out there that will say, I can say amen to that. And some people will say, ah. Oh. But all in all, as I said, you go check out the information yourself and you will be blown away at what you find on the subject. I hope you'll come back next week as we continue our journey with maybe a little less controversy in Colossians. I hope to see you here next week. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.